Okay, so moving on to the psychology away from the neuroscience. Um, I think we're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs from the physiological needs at the bottom, um, needs for food, water, that sort of thing, safety and security, physical safety and security above that, um, and then the emotional needs of belonging and significance um, or attachment and status. Um, these ones are um, key to RP and to what we do in schools. And what we're aiming for, obviously, is, is self-actualization uh, at the top of the Maslow pyramid. Um, Marzano and Kendall uh, modified this, or Marzano modified this, um, in his work and suggested that um, people, once they're self-actualized, actually need a sense of purpose, uh, an attachment to something higher than themselves. Uh, and I think we see that in our kids um, on a regular basis here. Um, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy and connect it with the neuroscience that we've looked at, um, then the physiological needs and safety and security, the two bottom rungs of, of the pyramid, really relate to the, um, the lizard brain, the um, brainstem and, and diencephalon, or brainstem in particular, um, physical safety and, and awareness of threat and danger um, relate to that part of the brain. The belonging and significance, obviously, is, is the mammalian part of the brain, and that introduces the limbic system um, to, the, uh, to the equation. Um, and the top part, self-actualization and purpose, is about the cortical thinking. Uh, it's about the executive function. It's about the reasons why we find fulfillment uh, in life. This matches up pretty clearly with Perry's idea of regulate, relate, reason, uh, because if there are challenges to safety or security or physiological needs, um, the young person's not going to be regulated and therefore not going to be able to connect or to relate um, to anybody around them. So we need to deal with regulation first uh, before we can relate. Um, and once we can relate, then we can reason. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy fits beautifully with the, um, with the neuroscience. I wasn't born angry, but I learned to be angry. I wasn't born rude, but I told my teacher to piss off. Phones are not allowed in class, Polly. I wasn't looking at it. I wasn't born silent, but I learned to keep my mouth shut. I wasn't born invisible, but I didn't want to be seen. Simon, could you sit on your seat properly, please? I wasn't born anxious, but everything was frightening. It's really important that schools understand that you are the centre of their lives. Sometimes, for some children, you're the only still point in a storm. I really don't want you missing my classes, Bobby. You're a good student. I should believe that. <laughs> I wasn't born a vandal, but I smashed up my classroom. Beth! I wasn't born a show-off, but I needed to get attention. Toby, that's not helping. What would help is attachment. And initially the child needs a carer in the school to function a bit like a soothing parent and in a way functioned like the frontal lobe of the child. You're feeling scared, trying to run away from what you've done, but you can't. Come on, Martin. You need to tell us the truth about what happened. Then we can get this sorted. I was lucky. At school. At college. In the infants I had a teacher. A teacher. A teacher. Who listened. Who understood. Who made a difference.
So let's move on to the human emotional system. Uh, and some of you have heard me say these things before. The, uh, I liken the human emotional system after Nathanson uh, to a computer. Uh, if you look at a computer, a computer has hardware. Um, so it has drives and screens and keyboards and things like that, um, central processing units. Um, and though you might pay a lot more for you know one version of this hardware to another, the hardware is pretty much the same uh, from one computer to another. Some of it might be a bit faster, some of it might be a bit you know fancier, but it, the hardware is essentially the same. On top of the hardware, there's there's firmware encoded in the machines. Uh, the firmware, which we don't interact with very much, we don't notice very much, um, controls things like interpreting what happens when you press a key on the keyboard or when you say print. Uh, it's the firmware that's that knows what to do with that and sends the ones and zeros to the printer in the, in the right pattern and so on. Um, and from one machine to another, the firmware is pretty much the same. Uh, in that it, it serves the same purpose. It's not been made by the same manufacturer or, or doesn't look the same, but uh, it serves the same purpose. All computers can take information from the keyboard. All can present it on a screen. All can monitor where the mouse is and what it's doing. And all of that stuff is, is below the scenes as firmware um, that we're not aware of. So at these two levels, your computer and my computer is basically identical. Um, no matter how much we paid for it, and no matter what model they are, um, they serve the same purpose. What makes your computer different from mine, and what makes mine useful to me, is the software that I've got installed on it. The things that I've added to it over time since I've bought the computer. Um, and that's what makes it useful to me, and it makes it unique to me. Um, if you look at the human body, then we have hardware as well. We have a central nervous system, the neurotransmitters, the muscles, the hormones, all part of the um, emotional hardware that we have uh, because they're, they're sensing information around us, they're sending it to the brain, they're processing it, and they're responding um, with things like increased heart rate and respiration rate and so on. So from you and me, the central nervous system hardware is pretty much all the same. Um, similarly, we have firmware that's, that's below our level of consciousness that performs certain functions. Uh, and these are the affects and the drives. Uh, we have a hunger drive, we have thirst, we have a, a sex drive, we have uh, nine affects that we'll see um, that begin the interpretation process when the information comes into the hardware that reads all of the stimulus that is around us. Um, these affects run little routines like a printing routine on a computer, and it's pretty much the same from one person to another. So at this level of hardware and firmware, uh, all of us are pretty much the same. What makes us different is not that part, that's the biology of it. What makes us different is what we've experienced since we came on the scene. Uh, our, the sum total of our learning, our social conditioning, our experience. That's the software that we run. Um, and that's our biography. So we are a potent combination of, of our biology, which is essentially all the same, and our biography, which is unique. And that's why each of us is a different personality. Each of us is a different person. So what happens when we experience something is that the hardware the hardware that we have is bombarded by stimuli from the environment um, one stimulus will trigger an affect um, and that's like a subroutine it's like hitting print on your computer um, it does pretty much the same thing for every person. Uh, it produces a physiological response in the body. Affect, like the firmware on the computer, is not part of our conscious experience. We don't experience the affect, we experience the physiological response. So to give an example, 
if you look at the stimulus, maybe you're walking home late at night, uh, dark street, um, you're feeling relatively comfortable, but then you hear footsteps behind you. Um, you may not even be conscious of hearing footsteps behind you, but you will have heard them subconsciously. And that might trigger the affect fear. Now, at this stage, it might not be um, anything conscious uh, with you at all. But the affect causes a physiological response. The fear affect causes a physiological response. Your heart rate starts to increase. Your respiration starts to increase. The blood gets shifted to the major muscles in your legs and so on, preparing for a fight or flight or freeze response, uh, which is the standard response to a, a threat. Um, and this might very well be the first that you're aware that there's some potential danger. That is, you experience the physiological response. And when you become aware of the physiological response, we call that a feeling. You have a feeling of fear. Um, the feeling doesn't precede the physiological response. The physiological response prompts the feeling. And it's at that point that the subconscious goes, hang on, I've felt f this feeling before. Now, how have I felt it before? What's it been like before? And what did I do? In other words, what have I learned about the feeling of fear? And when all those past stories jumble together and come back, we call that the emotion. So if you look at timeline, the stimulus might be a fraction of a second. An affect is a second or two. The physiological response might be a few seconds, a feeling a minute or so. And by that stage, you've trapped an emotion which could last for an hour. Um, if the emotion itself causes further physiological responses, you can set up a feedback loop and that emotion could run for hours or days, in which case we'd call it a mood. And that depends very much on the social conditioning or experience or learning that you have. In other words, that depends on your biography. So in this scheme, pretty much everybody would have the same response up to the feeling stage. And it's just when the feeling accesses your memory banks and becomes an emotion that you get a unique emotional response to some stimulus. The affect system's job is to sort out the stimulus into what's important and what's not. So its job is to throw a spotlight on a particular piece of stimulus that's coming into the body. Now, if we match this up with the four parts of the brain that we've looked at before, the brainstem is very much the central nervous system hardware. The brainstem is what takes all the information in and feeds it up through the limbic system and the cortex. Um, it filters it out and it decides what's important. And that's the reptilian brain. Once it pushes up to a feeling, we're introducing the limbic system, which is the mammalian brain. And the cortex is how we decide what we're going to do. Um, the human brain, the, the prefrontal cortex, is how we decide what we're going to do on the basis of our experience um, with this feeling before. So in this video, what we see is that um, there are uh, two people experiencing exactly the same stimulus, um, but their emotional responses are vastly different, and that's because of the different scripts uh, that they've developed. So the takeaway from this part of the emotional system is that what we feel, think and do is a product of two things, our biology and our biography. It's a product of the, the affects that are triggered and they're common to everybody. 
we'll see in a moment that there are nine specific affects. Um, we're only going to look at three of them, but we're, there are nine, and they're common to most people's experience. In fact, all around the world. Um, so it's a product of that biology, but then what makes us unique and our responses unique is our biography. Uh, and I'll introduce a term here, our scripts. Um, we have learnt scripts in the, in the playwright um, stage sense. We have learnt scripts to follow when things uh, happen. Um, so when we're afraid, we do this. When we're uh, happy, we do that. Um, when we get up, we, you know, we make a cup of coffee. We have scripts that we follow during a day. Some of them are important. Some of them are less important. Um, but the more we learn about how we do things and how we successfully do things, the more we write these scripts.